When it comes to training in Football Manager, there's a lot to learn. It's always been that way and never more so in FM23. In today's video, I'll be giving you five easy to do tips that will hopefully take your training from one level to another and get the best results out of your players. Hi everyone, Jake here for FM Scout. Welcome to the video where, as mentioned, we'll be giving you some quick and easy training tips that you can implement to get the best out of your player's development. Now, if you end up enjoying this video or you find it useful, then smash that like button for us. Comment down below your easiest training tips and subscribe for more daily football manager content. And with that being said, I don't want to keep you here forever. So let's get right in to tip number one. So first, we're going to start off with the easier concepts to understand and get a little more complicated towards the end. But do stick with me because those ones at the end might blow your mind and completely change the way you think about training. But the first one, whether you love training and have all your schedules or you never really use it when it comes to a player's individual training, make sure they're training a role. So as an example here, we've got Dane McMullen, a young goalkeeper in my Aberdeen save, which by the way, if you want to check out that series, you can find that linked on my channel in the description down below. A lot of you guys have came over and really enjoyed it, but very recently we got a great youth intake. Now, if I was to leave Dane McMullen's training like this, it wouldn't be the world's end. Of course, he still will develop a little bit, but to get the best out of these players, we need to make sure they're focusing in on a role, not just a playing position. So for example, here, he has goalkeeper playing position. I do not want him to be training that. It does not get the best out of him. Instead, you want to focus a role, whether that's goalkeeper or sweeper keeper. If it's a midfielder, you might be choosing Mezada, box to box, whatever it might be. You need to make sure you're choosing a role because one, you can actually start to mold that player into the kind of role that you'd want them to play, which is obviously a great benefit. But as you can see there's now a highlighted bunch of attributes that are being targeted that otherwise weren't necessarily being trained individually. Now that we've got a focus on those attributes we should see more of a growth in those areas and it's vital that you have that selected for all of your players. Again another example if we were to take Ross McCory here he can play a bunch of positions but I'm making sure he isn't just on midfield centre he's actually got a role and also a duty that will give him a greater focus in training and allow him to develop much better and you'll see way better results than if you didn't do this but that's just step one we'll come back to individual training later let's move on to tip number two now this one I suppose you could say it doesn't necessarily fall into training exactly, but it does and it does have a big weighting and that is your player's fitness and fatigue and a particular staff member that can help with that issue. So if we take a look at our players here, you can see their condition, their sharpness and their injury risk. Now, as many of you have probably realized by now, the worse the player's condition is, the more tired they are, the more likely they are to pick up an injury. And you can see that here, the guys that have pretty much not played and are fully fit, have less of a chance of an injury. It all makes perfect sense. But what you might not know is there's actually a value in-game assigned to this level of tiredness, and it's called fatigue, which you can see with the in-game editor. So if I take Phil Bardsley here, who, by the way, has been a stinker of a transfer, and I go to edit player attribute details, go to fitness, you can see his fatigue is at a level of 27 out of a thousand, which doesn't seem that bad. It doesn't seem specifically awful, but I'll show you someone else, Joe Lewis, a player who is not really played at all. He's a backup goalkeeper. He's fully fit. His fatigue is sitting at minus 500, which is the lowest it can be. That's going to reduce his risk of injury. But how are we getting accurate representations of this? And how can we reduce fatigue in our players so that they don't get tired as much? What you can do, of course, is monitor them in the medical center, adjust the player's trainings who might have a high injury risk. And that's, of course, great. However, there's a staff member who can help you a lot in this. And it is the sports scientist, who you might not think about too much. If I go over to our head of sports science here, where is he? He has a sports science rating of 13. Now, the higher this sports science rating, the lower your player's fatigue is going to be and the more accurate of a report they will give you on your player's fitness and fatigue. Of course, this will allow you to identify players who are at risk. But like I say, the better your sports scientist, the lower the fatigue is going to be on your players, which is great. It reduces the risk of injury. And if all that still isn't enough for you, sports scientists Scientists also help reduce the risk of long standing injuries and injuries coming back to players, which is of course great. So my big suggestion for training is of course, get good staff members because that will boost your training massively, but also you need to monitor your player's fitness and a good sports scientist will help you a long way when it comes to that. Now for these next two tips, I've switched over to my Fenerbahce save as the Aberdeen players were on an end of season break. But what I'll be covering here is specific trainings that you can do to help increase your tactical familiarity and also 
also your team cohesion, which are massive factors in how your teams perform on the pitch. We'll start off with the tactical familiarity one. Now, when you start a new tactic, obviously your players aren't going to know that tactic inside and out. Now you can use pre-season to get used to a tactic. You can throw it on players in the middle of the season, but this familiarity will take a while for players to get used to. And until they're fully familiar with the tactic, you won't be seeing it performing at the highest levels. And of course, that isn't what we want. We want to see our players playing our tactic great, fully understanding it, everyone knowing their position and role, and the way that you can quickly boost this tactical familiarity if you feel like you need it. Maybe you've changed tactic mid-season and you need that quick boost. What you can do, go to your training tab, and when it comes to adding a session, let's say we didn't want our players to rest here. Instead, we wanted them to do a session to help with their tactical familiarity. You might think that you go to the tactical section, go to attacking shadow play. Great, there we go. We can see this is going to work on the tactical familiarity of our players, but you'll see straight away that the attackers are getting 60% of the benefit with the defenders and the goalkeepers splitting the other 40% between them equally. Now that isn't perfectly ideal because what it will mean is our attackers will get to learn the tactic but not everyone will develop their tactical familiarity at the same rate. Now this tip came from the brilliant Leo Demos who did a video last year but instead if you go to match preparation and then match tactics you will see instead we get a 100% priority from all players so it's going to be split between everyone on these things that we can see here. Of course their attributes but also team cohesion and more importantly for us right now tactical familiarity and you can see how many different things are affected by tactical familiarity by doing this training these players are becoming more familiar with these aspects of a tactic which is great and it will allow us to get that tactical familiarity up at a faster rate so if you feel like you need to do that then go for it but i did mention another factor that affects players and that is in the dynamic section and team cohesion. Now, often if you've got a lot of new players at the club, they don't know how to play well together, which is perfectly understandable. Much like tactical familiarity though, if you want to boost this team cohesion at a faster rate, there's an easy fix if we go to training. If you go down to the extracurricular section and go to community outreach or team bonding, you can see that will increase your team cohesion. Now you get a slightly increased team cohesion from community outreach, but if we go to team bonding, we can see that's gonna have a massive effect on our players' team cohesion, but also their happiness, which is great. And if you ever feel like you need a quick boost, maybe you've bought loads of players one summer, then throw in a few of these team bonding sessions every week or so, and you will see some great improvements there. And it's a quick, easy tip that you can do to help your side. Now for the final tip, and the one that I think will blow your mind. Now this one I found out from Leo Damus in a video, and when I watched it, I was just like, wow, really? That's, that's the case? And it blew me away. And I'm hoping for you guys that don't know about this, that it will Will also be a massive eye-opener to you. And it's all about individual training. Now we mentioned it earlier and we'll come back to it again. As you know, you can go onto every player and set that individual training, which is great. You can focus in on a particular weakness, on a particular role, and that's exactly what you want. You want to be able to fine-tune your players' trainings. Now you might go through and do this for every player, spend loads of time doing their individual training, but not see the results that you want. And this could be the reason why. If I go to our calendar here and I just take a look at this general week that's been prepared by our assistant manager. We've got some defending training. We've also got some attacking training as well in there, which is cool. We've got some possession training one day as well. We've got a match preview here. You can see it's doing loads of great work for our players, loads of positives, but you might have been thinking that during all of this, your players are also doing their individual training. But this actually isn't the case, and it's actually written right in front of our eyes. There's only certain training routines that actually help increase the individual training that you've put on a player. I'll show you what we're looking for. If we go to the outfield team session, you'll see our outfielders are doing loads of great stuff, but actually our goalkeepers are training their individual roles. And this is where all that work that you put into individual training is actually taking place. Out of all of these sessions, from what I could see at a quick glance, this was one of the few that actually had an increase in their individual training roles. And even there, it's only the goalkeepers and it's only 40% of the priority with most of the training going to those outfield players, which might blow you away. But how can we stop this? How can we make sure that our players are still doing their individual training? Well, as we see here, there's specific training routines that actually have individual roles listed as a benefit. So I'll show you a few of the best ones you can do there. If we go to match preparation and then to attacking movement, you will see in this one, 
All of our players' individual roles are being focused, and of course, as it's attacking training, we're mainly focusing in on the development of those attacking players, with 60% of the priority going to them. And alternatively, if you wanted to flip that for your defensive players, you go to the defensive shape, and you will see their individual roles are being trained. But once again, if you went to defending aerial defense, the defenders aren't actually getting any benefit from their individual roles. Only the attackers and the goalkeepers are getting some benefit. Same here as well, ground defense, you're getting a little bit of a boost in the individual roles, but if you went to attacking shadow play, there's nothing. That's not helping anybody's individual training. If you went to attacking and attacking wings, again, nothing. No benefit to your individual training. So make sure when you're setting up these training sessions, make sure you have at least a few sessions that say individual roles so your players can actually get the benefits out of all of that individual training you put on, else it can be completely worthless in doing so. So make sure that you get that done. And that's five quick tips that I hope will help you guys in your player development, in your training, and hopefully winning a bunch of more matches. If you have found this useful, smash the like button for me, subscribe for more, and I'll see you next time. Thank you and goodbye.